Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. It's an exciting day to talk about the Democratic Republic of Congo, and we're very glad to have you here. Thank you for braving the snow and the cold. Uh, I'm Michael Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program, former Peace Corps volunteer in Kikwit, and we have uh, a panel to begin the discussion of Congolese and Congolese Americans, including my good friend Laura, also a Kikwit uh, origin person, uh, even more authentically than I. Um, but we, we, we begin the panel, and then we also have on this panel, uh, in addition to Laura Coupe, who's a former Obama administration official as well, we then have uh, Mvemba Dizolele, who is a professor at Johns Hopkins University, Congolese, Congolese American, uh, and a, and a full-time scholar on this subject, as well as a long-standing practitioner in election observations in Congo. He's seen a lot. Uh, he's got a multitude of thoughts to share with us today. And then finally, one of his former students, one of my former colleagues, uh, the only Congolese graduate of the U.S. Military Academy to date that I'm aware of, my friend Mulala Nguramo, who also is Congolese American and uh, continues to be passionate about his country. And I think that's safe to say for all of our panelists and for everyone here in the room. So here's how we're going to proceed in the next two hours. We also are joined remotely by Tom Perriello, the Honorable Tom Perriello, former congressman from Virginia, uh, and also, as many of you will know, the former special envoy in the Obama administration for the Great Lakes region. And what I'm going to ask Tom to do in just a minute is begin us uh, off with a few of his own thoughts and reflections, just to frame the conversation for this first panel, which will then primarily be, at least in the early phases, uh, a discussion by Congolese about what they've just witnessed in their country and how it, they feel about it, how they view this moment in history, how they think about the options and the opportunities and the potential pitfalls before us. And we thought that was the best way uh, to really begin this important conversation. In the second hour, we'll have a different panel, which will be primarily American analysts and practitioners in Africa, people with longstanding uh, experience in democracy promotion in uh, election observation, and we have some of that kind of expertise on this panel too, but I'll save the introductions for them for later. So without further ado, I just want to say one more word by way of framing. I think you all know why we're here. Uh, you wouldn't be in this room if you didn't understand that eight days ago, Congo inaugurated a new president, Felix Shishikede, the son of a longstanding uh, activist and dissident and advocate for democratic change, ATN Shishikede, who had passed away uh, just a short time before. And the election, of course, was a surprise in many ways. Very few people consider it to have been fair, but also very few people actually predicted it would even happen uh, or that it would not be completely rigged in favor of the preferred candidate of the previous president, Joseph Kabila. Mm. And as things turned out, Kabila's presumed uh, preferred candidate did not win the election. And so as a person who's watched Congo for a long time, like many of you, I don't know whether to be excited or scared, happy or unhappy, or maybe a little bit of all of the above. And I'm not quite sure what this moment portends for Congo's future or for the future more generally of democracy in Africa. Is this a step forward? Is this a step back? Is, is it way too soon to know? Those are the topics and questions before us today. Uh, I'll admit, I'll put my one uh, personal opinion on the table, I'm 51% happy and 49% scared and unhappy. So I'm a slightly glass more than half full because I never really thought elections would happen. I thought they would be delayed indefinitely or perhaps uh, be accompanied by violence or be, perhaps be accompanied and produce the outcome that I feared most, which was a completely rigged election in favor of the preferred Kabila candidate. It may have been a rigged election, but it wasn't apparently his top choice. And this comes after, uh, I will say one more word of framing. We all know that Congo has never previously had a successful peaceful, peaceful transfer of power. And uh, that makes this moment, if nothing else, auspicious and potentially an opportunity. Uh, we know that after decades of mistreatment and brutality by, at the hands of the Belgians and a very unhappy colonial experience that in my judgment was among the worst that any African country experienced on the continent. And certainly the world did not leave Congo with the raw materials for success a little over a half a century ago when it became independent. We then saw a tortured period when Zaire was often the focal point of great power and superpower competition and Cold War uh, proxy conflict that didn't help matters much. We, the outside world, didn't leave Congo with a great running start. 
towards any kind of a successful future. And that's part of why I'm choosing to frame today's situation as at least somewhat hopeful compared to where we've been and where we might have expected uh, things to be at this juncture. Enough framing from me. Tom, if you're still on the line, I wanted to invite you, please, to, to say whatever you want to say by way of framing the moment you see us at with DRC. And again, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, the Honorable Tom Perriello. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much for this conversation and for having me, even if it's in this awkward uh, way of looming behind the panelists. Um, <laughs> if it's all right with you, I'd actually really love to hear from the panelists first and then maybe add some comments at the end of that um, uh, to hear from uh, Congolese and Congolese American experts uh, and then maybe try to, to reply to that if that works. Let's do it. Okay, so Laura, and then the same question to everyone and just look forward to your your opening assessment of where we are. And feel free to be as personal or as passionate or as emotional or as analytical as you want to be. Put it in historical terms, put it in personal terms. I just want to hear how the three of you are feeling about where your country of origin is today. And please, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Mike. Good morning, everybody. So I'll, I'm going to speak through the personal lens. So I'm sad uh, to be frank with you uh, because I felt like this was a great opportunity to uh, support the Congolese people in their desire to ha um, you know, elect the, the, the head of their country. And I felt like this was a missed opportunity and that the international community um, chose stability and you know, quotation marks for, um, for an opportunity for uh, the Congolese people to really have their will heard. And especially also being American um, as a country that touts, you know, wanting to stand for democracy and justice. I just felt like this was a missed opportunity, especially given the fact that a lot of the Congolese population is young. And, um, and I just felt like we, we left them hanging in, in that regard. So I know Mike provided the overview in terms of the analytical uh, discussion in terms of the fact that there were elections, but I felt like this was a missed opportunity and I think especially as someone who is in the diaspora, I know that the world could move on and say, yeah, the elections happened and, you know, at least it was peaceful. But I just remember 2011 where this happened as well and the world moved on, but it's people like my parents that still have to pay for funerals and the lack of health care and have to pay for people's education. So I also think people forget, you know, people like my parents and us on the stage in the diaspora who carry especially the economic uh, burden at times, especially when the international community leaves the, I mean, in my opinion, has left the Cogley's people behind. And so I think it's interesting to think about the future in terms of how can people uh, like myself or, um, or us on stage uh, think about the future going forward in terms of how we can support our friends and family who uh, may not have that support from their government. So before we go to Mvemba, I just want to ask one quick follow-up. Are you suggesting that in addition to your disappointment, you think the United States should have fought harder uh, the idea of inaugurating Felix Shishikede as president, that we should have tried to disavow that electoral outcome, and there was a missed opportunity here just in recent weeks? I think so, because now taking my you know, more analytical hat on when it comes to Venezuela, we have a totally different rhetoric. And um, so it's interesting where we, in Venezuela, we see the international community actually um, trying to recognize the main opposition leader. So it shows that there are, uh, there, there, that is an example of where the international community has chosen to at least challenge uh, the, the current head of a, of a government. So it's interesting to think about why Venezuela and not in the Congo, where there's evidence suggesting that the person who now has been inaugurated as president did not win the election. Thank you. And the professor, over to you, please. By the way, the professor is from the coastal region. So we've got from Boma to Goma to Kikwit, we've got a wide representation geographically and otherwise on the panel. My friend, over to you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, I think the, um, this was supposed to be an historical moment for mm -hmm. the DRC. In many ways, it still is, but it's also a moment that has not particularly brought everybody together. It's been surprisingly a moment of division all of a sudden. Uh, on one level, we saw tremendous 
a tremendous convergence of various forces, right? So the Congolese came together against the Kabila regime, of which they were very tired. They didn't want anything to do with uh, Shadari. That was very clear. And the international community supported the Congolese in this effort. So they accompanied them. The U.S. Embassy did a lot of things. The EU, NGOs in the U.S. supported civil society and political parties in, uh, in that struggle. Um, I think the problem started when the results started coming in and that we all saw that something was off. We knew this. I mean, that was not a surprise. I mean, there were irregularities. We all had seen Corne Nanga give his spill in, in Washington, D.C. And I think at that moment, the Congolese were expecting the world to stand with them in terms of at least bringing transparency into, into the process. Um, we had um, been very flexible, the world that is, with Kabila, to say the least, in the name of stability, stability, stability. And of course, we know Congo is not stable today. It's no more stable than it was in 2001. And in fact, Congo has entered a zone which I'll call a turbulent zone, in the sense that we, are more in, we have more instability now. Right? So the conflict that had been traditionally nested in the eastern corridor of the Kivus and the Turi have since, uh, since moved. Right? Right. We have conflict in northern Katanga. We have conflict in the Kasai. And those are the armed conflict. Then we have an armed conflict, that civil disobedience in Kinshasa, in Bakongo, mm. in Equator, people unhappy. And any time, anything can explode in that sense. Um, so what could have been done? I think um, we saw the leaks from Senko data. We saw the leak uh, from CENI and other observation mission. Uh, the, a, uh, the African Union was skeptical of the result. Um, SADC was skeptical of the result. So then what gave? Um, I think we just didn't fight for the, with the Congolese. Uh, on the Congolese side, uh, it's a bit strange to see the cynicism of the international community because you hear more now, you know, when you deal with diplomats, it's always interesting. They're very nice people. They work hard, so we acknowledge that. Uh, but they also tell you things like behind closed doors, we've been pushing for this and pushing for that. Uh, in which case, you don't know if they're doing it or not doing it, because you can only judge them by the result. Right? And then, so we saw the contorted statement from the State Department, for instance, where you know, up to that point, the State Department was very clear. They issued some very strong statement about, we we're not going to support, we we're not going to tolerate fraud, we, Congress... Uh, push for sanctions for those people who derail fraud. I will uh, encourage fraud. But then we say we welcome the certification of this thing. I think it doesn't help. If, if, if I'm Felix Chisekedi, I have to know that I'm starting on the wrong footing because half the population does not believe I won. So it's not helping Congo. It's not helping anyone. Uh, if you're a partisan of Felix, then you really believe he should be given a chance. Uh, if you are not, you're saying... This is not what we fought for. We didn't fight for Felix or anybody who won to go in a coalition with Kabila against the people. Um, so this will come back to the diplomats. A lot of diplomats want to see Congolese in the street. But why do they have to go to the street when they've shown you that they actually believe in the process? They've seen enough violence. Now they just want the ballot to count. Mm. So we should have fought a little more. And I mean, if, if the court had gone through all the data, and waited for the AU delegation or any other pre pressure point and said, we reviewed everything and Felix won. Okay, that would have been fine. Mm -hmm. But there was this rush to certifying things that were very questionable. And I think that's problematic for the Congolese, for the world engagement in Congo, and for President Chisekedi himself. Mm -hmm. uh, it will never be seen as legitimate. It's going to be problematic. Thank you. And Mulala, over to you, my friend. Yeah, so thank you so much. And at first, I will agree with Vemba and the Cooper. And the thank you so much for the invitation. Well, I'll try to put it in two ways. Uh, first of all, I, I think it, the election provided a sense of worry, of concerns, in terms of, uh, like many people, wish we could have a transparency and a credible process so that people would not have to worry about the legitimacy of the president, mm -hmm. which, quite frankly, can pose a serious problem down the road. Yeah. Uh, like today, you'll see protests already, like in Kikwit, in Kinshasa, you know, even Goma. 
Uh, and uh, until now, the Electoral Commission has not published all the results so that people can dissipate on kind of doubt in, on, in terms of the, the legitimacy of the election of the president. The other point is, uh, quite frankly, I feel really optimistic and very proud of what the Congolese people did. Uh, like, look what happened in Beni, for example, in Butembo. These people were excluded, you know, but they organized their own elections. And I think they largely expressed the, the disbanding desire of the people in the country to have democracy and the freedom. Uh, regardless of whether the election was rigged or not, but what makes me very optimistic is this desire of people to have the election in the country, to have democracy. And quite frankly, regardless of what happened, I see this momentum keep growing in the country that will always keep politicians on check to do the right thing, it's particularly if they don't deliver in terms of uh, socioeconomic programs. You know, think th this is a country where we have a lot of young people, they have a lot of expectations, they want to have jobs, they want to have opportunities, they want to move ahead, you know, they want to be part of the global community. So quite frankly, regardless of everything happened, but what really make me very optimistic is this strong desire in the young people to be part of the political process, to hold their leaders accountable, mm. you know. And if they don't respond to their needs, they go into the street and ask them for, for the result. Mm. And uh, regardless, of, quite frankly, I think uh, I, I see a bright future ahead. Thank you. Tom, is this a good moment for you to come in and share your views and reactions? Sure. Um, thank you so much for all that wisdom, um, all of which uh, I will basically want to echo. I think, you know, in terms of looking forward, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and really an enormous amount does rest on Felix Giusecchetti. Um, does he prove the skeptics wrong, uh, that he is ready to start a new chapter, um, bring in anti-corruption efforts, give people a voice, or is he in fact just someone who's going to continue uh, uh, Kabila both directly and indirectly? So in terms of looking forward, I think you know we don't yet know, but let's be absolutely clear about what just happened. And what just happened was the Congolese people did everything that they were asked to do by the international community. They did it with unbelievable courage. They did it against the odds. Uh, they did it in a completely rigged political environment. Um, the Catholic bishops did everything they were asked to do. The diplomatic community is constantly saying, why don't you show leadership? We, you're the only legitimate body out there. They went and put their credibility on the line. They put their standing in the country on the line. Um, and the result was incredible, which was a peaceful election across the country, as was just mentioned, even in places where the government were, was trying to prevent voting from happening. People simply went in and took over the voting booths in, because they were so eager to express their opinion and start a new chapter. Uh, the results were not just uh, a small victory, uh, but they were an overwhelming victory, uh, an overwhelming defeat, certainly of President Kabila's candidate. Um, and I say that as someone who actually, until a month before the election, expected that Chisiketi would be the biggest vote getter and that people should unite around that. But this was a, a very different campaign that we literally had a whistleblower walk out of the semi with a digital file showing the polling place by polling place numbers. Uh, of a 35% victory for Fayulu over the next closest candidate. And what we saw from the region and from the West was crickets. After saying to the Congolese, you guys need to show the leadership, it's your country, but we'll be there with you, um, there was relative silence uh, when that happened. Um, I think diplomatically the biggest mistake was the period between the initial results and Seni announcing the results. Um, I even got some grief for some tweets that I sent during that period, but at that point, all of the numbers were clear. And when I talked to diplomats in the region and in the West, they said, well, we need to wait for the SENI numbers. I said, do you have any reason to believe that SENI will produce real numbers? They said, no, we know they will be false numbers. And I said, so what is it that you're waiting for in that period? So this is where the soft bigotry, I would say, of um, sort of a new colonialism comes in, both from the region and the West, which is people saying, well, you know Congo, you know how things work in Congo. And the question is, is that really how they work there, or is that how we enable them to work um, by failing to stand up for democracy and the rule of law when, when people are doing so? Now, I want us to just end the observations on the positive note. I think uh, because civil societies showed up in such a big way, because citizens showed up in such a big way, because the church uh, I think stood with those values. 
Um, there's an enormous amount of reason to believe the future of the DRC is going to be defined more by uh, that space than not. I think Felix Chisichetti, given uh, his family's tradition um, in the opposition, has every reason to try to rule in a way that builds his legitimacy and credibility with uh, those folks who were in the streets and, and helped to um, ensure that some form of alternance happened. Um, so I think there, there are a lot of lessons here, but I really do think it's rare to have seen that clear of a case of people standing up against the odds uh, and then having the international community essentially turn uh, a blind eye to those results. Um, in ways that uh, I think too often diplomacy we think is about solving problems, but more often it's about shifting or avoiding blame for you as an individual or as a country. Um, that being said, again, uh, I think that if you had said a year ago that there would be a peaceful election, uh, that Kabila would not stand, and that his candidate would not be declared the victor, um, uh, those are uh, very few people would have thought that we would be in that space. Um, so those would be some initial observations. Tom, that's great. Thank you. I think I'm going to go straight to the audience now because we have a lot of expertise and energy and, uh, you know, people who care about Congo and no Congo in the room. I'm going to just put my question as one in a litany that the panel can then address. My question, of course, is where do we go from here? And we've already heard some people touch on this. I think most people are suggesting we should try to work with Shishakati in some way. What that means, however, for U.S. policy options is something we'll talk about uh, in various formulations with this panel and the next one. So that's my question for everybody, but please don't answer yet. Let's collect a few more questions and thoughts from the crowd. Let's please, um, one request, because we have a full house and only a half hour for this panel, let's please have the questions be brief if, if you could, and any comment keep very short. I will, I will welcome comments if they are very brief. And please wait for a microphone and introduce yourself. We'll take about four questions before we come back to the panel as well as Tom. We'll go with the gentleman here in the fourth row and then the one right behind him after that. Good morning, my name is Bernard Jones with Clifford Risk Management Group. Thank you for your comments. My question is, we know the challenges are happening in Congo. Can you give us one positive takeaway as far as economic opportunities or public-private partnership you may see under the new president? Thank you, and then the gentleman right behind you, please. Thank you, good morning. Uh, Roger Murray with Aiken Gump. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I represent Martin Fuyulu and Moise Katumbi. Um, question uh, for the panel is, how do we raise the bar for next time? Um, our strategy for the recent months was pretty simple, try to raise the bar. Uh, we didn't realize quite how low it was. Um, and then second question, if I can, what limitations does Felix face um, given the, uh, you know, the majority of the, the presidential majority in, in the uh, assembly? And again, we're not going to ask everybody to respond to each question, so please be thinking of which ones you're most going to want to speak to yourself. Go, we'll stay up front here with the gentleman over here in the fourth row. Hi, um, I'm Archie from the Belgian Embassy. I have a question. How do you think the uh, relations will evolve with Belgium and with the European Union as well? Thank you. We'll take one more in this round from the woman right here in the fourth row. Hi, yes. my name is... Should I stand up? I'm, my name is Grace Collins, and I was approached uh, to help Felix, and I was invited to the in inauguration. I was not able to go on such short notice, but um, I noticed that, I mean, it's a step forward to me because the, real, the reality is the man has been in power for so long, and he has 350 Kabila people in the Congress. So I think it's a step forward to at least be realistic of the change of power. You can't just go from dictatorship to purest human rights things. It's just, it's too ingrained in all the other previous presidencies and different relationships. And I'll see so what you my take. Question oh, is, you have a question, okay, go ahead. Go, <laughs> so go ahead. my question is, the State Department has now supported, and I, I just think that the international community should be supportive of him. Okay, and I will take one more since that was more comment than question. We're going to stay in the front for, go here in the second row. And that's fine. I like comments too. Didn't mean Asante to Saakwa, Kazayenu. Uh, my name is JT Stanley, and looking forward to the next election, kind of the big question is will Kabila run? And if he goes ahead and grabs power, what does that mean for Congo? And if that is kind of too far to see in advance, what factors should we be looking for in sort of predicting violence when the next election comes around? 
By the way, the entire second panel is here, so please, uh, second panel, listen to the questions. We may not get to all of them, right? Especially the ones that are more forward-looking for U.S. policy. We may wind up coming back to them in the second panel. But with that said, uh, feel free to address any, any and all of the questions you like, but ideally one or two per panelist, starting with Laura. Sure. Um, so in terms of economic uh, opportunities, I feel like um, the, uh, the, the, pro the INGA project uh, is an opportunity. Uh, for economic uh, development and, and interest in terms of the United States or and others, because again, everyone talks about the the potential of the hydroelectric power of the Inca project, and I feel like that could be an opportunity that could bring uh, folks from the private sector and the government together, uh, especially given that the Inga Dam has the potential to potentially power the whole. Uh, um, well, sub-Saharan Africa. So I think that's a great opportunity, especially for folks who want to look into energy and, um, again, touch on many segments or, or points in terms of an area where you could find a, a number of collaborators. Uh, in terms of um, I, I, the, Bel uh, the person from the Belgian embassy, mm -hmm. so you mentioned in terms of Belgium and the European Union going forward. Um, in that regard, I think there, it, there should be a greater discussion about uh, Congo and Europe's interconnectedness. Again, Belgium wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't for the Congo. A and I think in some elements, there should be greater discussions around uh, economic partnerships and job opportunities, especially because Belgium also has a big diaspora community with folks that have been educated in Belgium as well. So I think there is a lot of opportunities for, uh, for collaboration. And then also, I believe... Um, Pierre Compagnie's dad is the first uh, Congolese Belgian mayor. So I think there are opportunities for a dialogue to happen, especially with that growing community. And also talk about the bad, but also opportunities to, to make improvements. Thank you. Mbemba. Uh, on the economic uh, opportunity question, nothing is going to happen. I mean, Congo is full of opportunities, full of potential. But if there's no rule of law, if there's no transparency in the way things are run, Will you invest in Congo? So the, the, the challenge here for Felix Chisekedi is to show that he wants to create that space. Um, that space has not been there. Uh, who invests in Congo? Adventure, right? So a few years ago, Kabila was asking, was talking to a group of investors, and he told them, you should have the spirit of adventurism of Henry Morton Stanley and come to Congo. And I think that's how he's approached business over the last 18 years. So we get either a few multinationals who get everything, loot everything out of the country, or you have another cast of characters who are for quick money, but nothing that trickles down to, to the people. That's why Congo is among the fast growing economy, uh, the fastest growing economies in, in Africa or in the world, as far as the IMF and the World Bank is concerned but there is no job creation, there's nothing else, right? And so you will not go to Congo unless there is that climate, that environment that has been cleared. So that's one of the challenges for, for Felix Chisekedi. His father used to say, le peuple d'abord, meaning the people comes first. And that means you have to deliver for the welfare of the people. You cannot do that if you don't create jobs. You cannot do that if all your resources are being looted out and the revenues are not going into the national treasury and they find their way to Panama or to other offshore. So I don't see an upside to that unless President Chisekedi starts showing us that he's willing to put the change in place. And so far, it's hard to say. It's been only a, a week or so. Um, the European Union has to take itself seriously. I mean, I think the challenge is we, you know, Tom was mentioning the low, you know, the bigotry of low expectations. And we've seen that for the last 20 years. It's just we're not expecting much of the Congolese, and we're trying to feed them things they don't need. You know, like, well, humanitarian, humanitarian, humanitarian. Congo is not a humanitarian crisis. It's never been. Congo is a political crisis, and the Congolese are working to solve the crisis. Let's solve that crisis. Everything else will fall in place. The UN will be out of Congo because the Congolese can build an army. They're capable of fighting. They've been doing it for the last 20 years. So it's not like they cannot fight. And they can fight this time to, to protect their own country. Um, let's bring in government that is legitimate so they can put transparency in governance. So until those things are in place, we I don't see any change. And uh, as far as um, 
how do we go from dictatorship to democracy? We've not, you know, Congo has been in this limbo. It's, it's not full dictatorship, it's not full democracy. Uh, you know, this is why the Congolese civil society is so vibrant. They do things. That's why Kabila fell to stay around as, as president. So the things that are happening, we don't expect the new president to be perfect, but we expect him to start delivering on civil liberties, again, on transparency and management. Pay your civil servant, pay your military, fire generals who are problematic. Uh, those are the things that work in any country. Congo is no different. I think our standard should be the same in judging Congo. They should be the same on judging Felix Tshisekedi as they were on judging Kabila or in judging any other leader. Um, if, the, if the international community had been more engaged and pushed for transparency in the result, then who would have questioned Kabila's majority in parliament? Because we caved in, now we cannot question that. So we've actually condoned a situation that's going to be worse for Felix Tshisekedi. It's interesting. Good point. Yeah, Good yeah thank you. First of all, I'll agree with Cooper and, and Vemba. I'll just take the Murray uh, question of limitation of Felix just to build on your, your comment. First of all, let's understand the, the, the power structure today in the DRC. Felix is a kid who won the election, but he does not control the parliament where the prime minister will come from. And I think more likely the, you know, the FCC, the Kabila camp, will control the, the Senate, where more likely Kabila, rumors say, he might come back as a president of the Senate, which means that, uh, again, as to your question, what's the future of Kabila? Why not? Maybe tomorrow you might see him president of the Senate and he might replace Chisekade and he come back again. So you see the problem. In addition to that, uh, having a prime minister who comes from the, the Kabila camp can be a serious problem for Felix Chisekade. Most of the decision, it's actually the prime minister who runs the government. Even if Chisekade might want you know, the, you know, to do something great, you know, deliver to the people along those lines. But I see a situation where the people from the FCC side might be blocking him. And that actually might create some kind of political paralysis in the country. And Felix will be unable to deliver to the not only socioeconomic problem, uh, problem of the country, but also to respond to other issues, uh, uh, you know, such as securing the eastern part of the DRC. You see Yumbi, the, the killings Yumbi, and then the humanitarian crisis, uh, humanitarian crisis as well um, uh, in the country. So, and quite frankly, I can be honest, we have a political serious crisis in the Congo. And if possible, Felix Sekedi should call everybody Call Moise, call Bemba, call all these guys to talk about the issue get, and, and find a way how to get out of this situation. Because otherwise, I don't see, quite frankly, how he'll be able to govern the country. And let me put it this way. Imagine if we have an election, but you take these big guys in Europe, they're not able to go back. Think about it for a minute. So we have a serious problem. Okay? In my view, as long as these guys are still outside of the country, we'll still have a political crisis in the country. They, perhaps the the measure of the credibility and transparency of the election or the willingness of Felix Sekedi to bring the country toward the rule of law, quality governance, he, had, he must be able to bring this guy in the country, create a political environment where everybody will be part of the process and then rebuild this country again. Otherwise, quite frankly, I really doubt, as Vemba would say, said here before, he'll be able to deliver on the economic side because people to come to invest in the DRC, they, they must feel confident of the situation. Can they invest the money and they get it back? And quite frankly, right now, the country is in a very serious you know, crisis to do that. Even beyond that, the economy is in a very in a terrible shape. If you look, I don't know if you read yesterday, um, the, 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 the treasure of the country is empty. So the people who will come to help the country, the IMF and the international community, all, all, all kind of things. And right now, I don't see a... a trustworthy environment, quite frankly, where people will come in and, and you know, help the economy of the country and they deliver a job. And quite frankly, if Felix does not do that, I'm seeing protests strike perhaps in six and seven months, which quite frankly can paralyze the whole country. Thank you. Tom, any comments you'd like to offer at this time? Um, sure. To start with where you started, Michael, I think that the question of whether we should be working with Felix Giuseppe, of course, is yes. Uh, he's the president of the country. Um, I happen to think he's a good man that made a very bad deal, um, but he's got to make a decision right now about whether he actually considers himself president of the DRC or does he consider himself sort of Kabila's partner. And the fact of the matter is he has that title and can exert an enormous amount of leadership from that position. And I think if he decides to make a five-year commitment 
to the things that have been mentioned here, to restoring the Constitution, restoring uh, the plurality of political space, where the DRC was genuinely a leader in the region for many years, instead of in the sense of having lots of media outlets, lots of parties, having opposition around, that sort of thing. Second, on the investments, um, Kabila always ruled from a position of, of weakness, and so he had to keep the regions weak against each other, uh, keep the militias out there in order to kind of be seen as the only one who could hold it together. Giuseppe is obviously coming in from weakness in many ways because of the disputes about the results and other things, but he can lead in a strong way. On the investments, what I always heard from companies inside and out is, we're making the kind of investments you would make if you think about a two-year or three-year time horizon, because we don't know if there might be war or the economy falling apart. They're not making the kind of investments for a 20 or 30 year return where you see the transformational investments in infrastructure that Laura and others have mentioned. If President Chisikiti wants to bring in the conditions, as the professor mentioned, like the rule of law uh, and restoring confidence in that, you will see the unbelievable potential we all know that's there um, start to develop. Uh, but if instead it's the old coalition politics of trying to be just strong enough to survive, then essentially we have cost the DRC through, I think, weak diplomacy and, and uh, false promises, a, a generation of economic development. Um, uh, so I think that that opportunity exists. I think President Chisukedi, based on his own experience and his family's experience, still does have the moral credibility if his actions speak to that tradition. Um, to bring in uh, a real era of reform and change that is so clearly what the people of Congo wanted. You can get into Bayulu Chisikedi. What was clear was people wanted to reject the past and start something new. And I think if people do not see something that suggests a new chapter but a continuation of the old, they will see that very much as doing so against the will of the Congolese people. Um, so that's part about raising that bar for next time. Uh, I certainly think President Chisikedi could prove to be a transformational leader if he wants to step into that role and understand the full power of that position. And I think as the last can, uh, uh, speaker mentioned, it is important that not only did the international community in the region fail to stand by the presidential results that came out, uh, but paid almost no attention to the parliamentary results. Um, and understanding in the DRC the significance of the parliament um, uh, was something I think again that was uh, that was a missed opportunity here in this space. So certainly uh, all of us who care about the DRC uh, and the people of Congo should be working with the president, working with the people uh, to try to make this a new era. And again, given that very few people a year ago would have been predicting that we would be in the situation of a new president uh, without major violence and disruption. We do want to see if the glass is not half full or 49%. Your statistics, maybe it's a quarter full, but let's make the most of that and see um, uh, how we can build again on the, the courage of the Congolese people and their commitment uh, to their own constitution into that space. Fantastic. Mike, can I add yes, please. So a couple of things. Um, to go back to um, Roger Mary, Mary's question about how do we raise the bar. I think one is to start sanctioning the people who contribute to the fraud. Uh, that legislation has been talked about in Congress quite a bit now. We have the, a lot of communiques from various Congress uh, people. I think the credibility of the U.S. Congress is on the line in Congo. Uh, the embassy is one thing. The Congress, Congolese pay attention to what Congress says. And so if the Congress doesn't follow through with that, that sets kind of the, the next expectation for the cycle, the electoral cycle as it starts. What happened to Nanga? What happened to his team? Did we sanction them? Did we do anything about that? So the next person who comes, whether they approach a KD, we don't know what Seni will look like. Uh, they may do the same thing because that's the way things have tended to work in the past. So I think that's one way we can start raising the bar. Sure. Just like we have high expectations and this can work in Congo. The voters are doing it. Why can't the uh, institutions do it and the backers? And then, um, this economic thing is very important because that's where the jobs, that's where employment, that's where the welfare of the people lies. And um, just imagine that there were 15,000 candidates for the parliament, which is about 500 seats, for one coalition, from one Kabila's coalition, the FCC. 
So that tells us that there's no other job, that so everybody wants to be an MP of one kind or another. <laughs> You know, what, what makes it that you have 15,000 people from one coalition for 500 seats? Something is off. And that's what we need to resolve. Some of us don't want to be in politics. The people are doctors. The people want to go back and work. They just want that space. We see this in Ghana, big diaspora return. We saw this even places like Rwanda, big diaspora. If you create the environment, Congo will not need so much foreign aid because the Congolese will go back. Um, and they can help their own country. Excellent. I just want to come back on this, sir. Yeah. Uh, Really quickly, because I want to have time for a second round of questions. Okay, absolutely. First, I really support them, but quite frankly, we need to sanction the people who are part of this electoral fraud because it's not good for democracy or the future of this country. But also, uh, keep supporting civil society movement. Mm -hmm. I think they play a huge role to block a bill, to break the Congolese constitution, to seek a third term, but even to fall through his, uh, his, uh, his, his candidate. So my biggest concern as we are, coming, uh, we are moving forward, as uh, the special envoy said, will Felicia Sekedi be a transformation leader? I really hope so, because we really need that, so that um, perhaps five years from now we don't go back again, because the guy said, oh, look, guess what, let's win the election, you can just go along with it. You know what I mean? So we need to stop this, what seemed to be like a behavior. 2006, 2011, 2018, people rigged the election, they think it's, like it's normal. That's not the future. Okay. Thank you. So we have time for a second round for this panel and Tom before we switch to the second. And we'll start with the gentleman in the far back, please, Adam. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Pat Dabo from the Ghanaian Embassy. Uh, I want to know what does this election mean for Congo neighbors such as Uganda and Rwanda? Are we going to see joint effort in fighting militias, Lord Resistance Army, and Rwandan rebels operating in the RC? Great. Thank you. Good question. Uh, woman here in the blue shirt, please. Good morning, my name is Opope. I'm also a Congolese national. Um, I had a question with regards to what happens with the opposition now. As you know, Fayulu and, and Lamuka is going to be um, holding a meeting tomorrow. Um, what do you think will happen and what would be your recommendations for his team moving forward? Okay, a couple of more before we come back. Uh, right across here to the left, the woman in the, in the brown sweater, Adam. No, a couple of rows back. Hi, good morning. My name is Jennifer Lynn Scott with the International Republican Institute. Um, I think it's clear uh, from what you've said and overall that the U.S.'s and most of the international community's chief priority throughout this electoral cycle um, was to secure stability in DRC and the wider region uh, rather than encouraging or supporting a truly democratic process and outcome. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing Movemba or anyone else on the panel um, expanding a bit on the potential ways in which this current situation may actually contribute to an increasingly unstable DRC and region and what some recommendations would be at this point for the international community given the situation we're in moving forward to avoid any pitfalls um, and to try to improve the situation. And I'll just take one more and then we're going to come back to the panel and wrap up. So I'm going to stay in the back, the gentleman way over there by the side. Yes, please. Good morning, Alex Sanchez, Jane's Defense. Quick question, what do you think will be the future of MONUSCO? Uh, it's Monday expires on, the, on March 31st. It has 16,000 troops. We know the money will be, will be renewed, but how should it be transformed, if at all? Um, thank you. Excellent. So why don't we start with Mvemba, because you had one question directed to you personally. But then we'll, and also, this will be the final round for this panel, so any final thoughts you want to weave in. But we have about maybe two or three minutes for each panelist, please. Yeah, so to Jennifer's question, um, Legitimacy is the key here. Right? So Kabila had problem with legitimacy for 18 years. We saw that delivered. When you're illegitimate, and at least you start feeling that you become insecure, that's really what happened to illegitimate regimes. And when you become insecure, you start doing things that you're not supposed to do, arresting people, uh, doing all kinds of things. And so this will give, if President Chisekedi doesn't move quickly to put order, for instance, in terms of civil, civil liberties, with the police, with the army, to clear the DOD, the Department of Defense, Ministry of Defense, and put the right people, and start building the right military that Congo needs, then militias will continue to be emboldened because they will not see any reason to change. So the Eastern Corridor will continue to be unstable. Other people in the street, remember, we, we always see Congo in armed conflict. 
There is the other conflict, which is non-armed conflict. This is the civil, the civil rights movement, the youth movement. The government see them as danger. So they're also part of the conflict. They get arrested, they get killed. Um, so we'll continue to see that as long as people continue to see Felix Tshisekedi as not fully legitimate. People will challenge him on that ground, and that's ground enough to do that. Uh, and this goes also to the question Alex just posed. The future of MONUSCO will depend on what President Tshisekedi does with security. Yeah. So if he does well, then he gives grant for the Congolese to ask for MONUSCO exit. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight, but we can say over 10 years they need to, to exit. But you have to show parallelly that you're doing things that will convince the international community that the time has come. So those are my two thoughts. Great. Uh, Joseph, over to you, and then we'll come back to Laura. Sorry, yeah. I, I really agree with Professor Vemba here. I'll just try to wrap up the question of neighbor and stability together because they're tied into legitimacy problem. The, the perception that the election will really quite frankly a serious problem. And I sincerely hope that uh, President Felix Tshisekedi will do, provide effort to make sure people trust, you know, provide credibility and the transparency in the, uh, into the presidency so people can trust what is happening. Otherwise, I see even insurrection movement in the country, contesting the presidency, the president, because they feel he was not even elected. You know? uh, and that's why you know, we have been encouraged at the Federal Commission to publish all the result per voting centers so people can really, people need to have, they have the trust and the confidence of the president. That's the key here, so that people can feel safe you know, in the quiet in, uh, the, in the country. And it, it, it directly you know, affects the regional country, for example, if, you know, you see contestations starting in the country and you'll see humanitarian crisis in the country, you know, and usually people spill over the border in Angola, you know, uh, Chad, Congo Brazzaville, Rwanda, Burundi, all these issues. So I think regional countries should be concerned, you know, what's happening in the DRC uh, so that this issue of perception of legitimacy does not become a huge problem uh, down the road. I'll address as well the issue of MONISCO. I think we need more in the DRC. Yeah, the country's not ready yet. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned here the issue of the army. Uh, we still have to reform the Congolese army to enforce the rule of law and provide quality governance so that people can live in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And I think Bonisco still remains a, a key actor into this issue, particularly the eastern part of the DRC where people are still being killed in many uh, this area. Uh, Butembo, you go Yumbi as well. Uh, you go Nikasai, which is a similar problem. So I, I just hope, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Monique kind of le learn lessons learned of the past so they can make some progress as we are moving forward. It's hard to give any kind of advice to Martin. I think he knows what he's doing. Uh, but I sincerely hope he play a huge role in terms of continue supporting, you know, this ideal of democracy in the DRC, which the countries need very much. Particularly uh, as this election happened, uh, you know, we, we should not go back. We should continue on the path of promoting and, and enforcing Congolese democracy, which is very important for the future of this country. Before giving the floor to Laura and then Tom to finish up, let me make one brief point myself on the UN mission. This is the only topic where I've tried to sometimes weigh in on the debate in Congo. Otherwise, I'm too out of date, having not been back in 35 years. Uh, but in my work as a military analyst here at Brookings, one thing I've been struck by in recent years is the U.S. Army's ability to create a new concept called the Security Force Assistance Brigade, uh, which has been applied now in Afghanistan. Obviously, it's got a mixed uh, result there, uh, but it's a good concept, and it really tries to optimize our presence in a given foreign country as it tries to build up its own military. I would suggest that with a new president in Kinshasa, we consider offering a modest number of U.S. forces in that kind of capacity as part of the U.N. mission to think about the next phase, uh, trying to have that mission work its way out of a job by working with the Congolese military to try to help reform and improve its skill set by being out there in the field with it in these small advisory teams. So I would like to reintroduce that idea for the broader debate. But Laura and then Tom, over to you for your thoughts, please. Sure. Um, so Again, I agree with everything that Mulala and Vemba said, because I think the biggest thing is if there's no legitimacy, again, it will hamper uh, the new president going forward. But I'd like to talk about the aspect in terms of the pitfalls or instability. I think one area is the young people, again, because they, especially when you look at groups like La Lucha, they are very active on Twitter. I'm a millennial, so I follow everything via Twitter, but I think there is a lot of energy there. And again, if the new president doesn't 
you know, listen to the issues impacting young people like job creation or the fact that, um, again, they've invested so much time in trying to have the elections being held, then if that energy is not harnessed, that, again, is a missed opportunity. And again, it could be, like it's been alluded, a huge underbelly if it's not addressed could explode and, like, men like we've all mentioned, could lead to greater instability. And then one aspect in terms of the way forward is I've shared with Mike that I'm part of a group of Congolese American millennials that is trying to think of creative ways, trying to navigate this environment, because as we know, this problem is not going to get solved tomorrow, and there are deep political and regional issues that we won't solve today. But at least there are areas um, like philanthropy or healthcare education where folks uh, who are interested in Congo or in the diaspora could collaborate to make day-to-day -day impact. Because again, like Mulela mentioned, the treasury is empty, but people need jobs and they need to feed their children. So uh, we've uh, organized an event in <coughs> September 14th at Columbia Law School to have a summit where we can bring these types of ideas together, especially in those areas that, we've, that I've mentioned, because those are areas that we think we could have a direct impact. And it's a way to think forward and think of the future. Because again, um, as you mentioned, the challenges are uh, very great, but there are opportunities to be creative and innovative. Excellent. Thank you. And former Special Envoy Perry Allo, again, thank you for joining us today. Over to you for your thoughts at this juncture and any last concluding uh, observations you want to offer. Uh, sure. First, when most uh, countries talk about caring about stability, they don't actually really mean that they care about stability. They just don't want so much instability that they might get blamed for it. So as long as it's not on the front page A1 and somehow uh, that particular uh, country or their diplomats can be blamed for it, that's really often what's happening. And I think this was a clear case of being okay with instability in the DRC for an extended period of time. Um, it would have been difficult to put all of the diplomatic levers of the region in play to actually make sure that the credible result played through. The stability impacts of that would have been enormous. Uh, the notion of this being a rule of law moving into an anti-corruption era. In fact, one of the reasons a lot of the outside countries weren't that excited about Fayulu is that he hasn't played their game. He hasn't spent a lot of time in their capital. He was seen as someone who was a genuine kind of reformer in the streets. So I think we, we really don't get the stability argument uh, right, particularly with any sort of medium to long-term basis. I think the Minusco question really comes back to this broader debate about President Chisikedi making a decision of what his political calculus is. For the last few years, Kabila and Minusco have had a deal where Kabila needs Minusco to be in the country, but he doesn't want them to be able to do anything. Minusco wants to stay in the country um, and therefore does not want to admit that they have no ability to actually solve any of the problems they've been asked to solve. Chisukedi, as president, should set the goal. And the goal, and he, it's his call, not mine, but something like, look, we are going to defeat the armed groups uh, within the next three years, uh, and I am going to work jointly with Minusco and, and, you know, again, I'm not a military expert, but whatever it is, and say, as a president, we are setting this goal and we're going to hold Minusco accountable to it, but also give them the capacities to do it. If, like Kabila, he decides that he wants them there because it's such an important part of stimulus for the economy, but doesn't want them to actually solve these problems because that may change uh, some of the political realities in the region, then we're still in the same uh, political calculus. So two, two things just to end on. One, I really do think that um, the, the international community in the region owe the Vatican and the Catholic bishops an apology. Uh, the extent to which they asked this group and call on this group to lead, risk a great deal. And then uh, when that organization was trying to make sure that the people's voice was respected, uh, I think the silence when there were critiques talking about they'd become partisan or taken sides or other thing was really a particularly shameful moment, not just for how this played out, but that is a resource of legitimacy that is needed for the ongoing, much longer effort push for strong civil society and human rights. And this is where I will end. I still remember back in 2015, meeting with some youth groups in Kinshasa um, and having them say something that's been ringing in my ears for the last couple weeks. They said, we do not actually think anyone who's going to get elected this time is going to make that much of a difference. But alternance itself 
is going to be the key that makes us believe it's worth trying for the next election cycle, maybe running ourselves in the next election cycle. I don't think we're quite past that inflection point because of how this played out, but we could be, with the efforts that Laura and others mentioned, this could be the moment that was not the turning point that all, you know, the heavens opened and, and, and all rule of law came down, but there was a meaningful enough change that gave people enough hope to stay with this project of building uh, the next generation of leadership uh, that thinks very differently. So I do think that there's a lot here um, to draw on from hope, even though that there are some serious frustrations along the way. So um, I, I'm honored to be part of this panel uh, and to continue to, um, to see where all of us in whatever capacity can be part of that, writing that next chapter uh, and next generation that doesn't happen overnight for the DRC. It's fantastic, Tom. Before I ask you to join me in thanking panel one, I just want to explain we're now going to swap out. We're not really going to have a break because we're trying to keep this moving and we only have until 12. So if you need to stand up and stretch, feel free. And Mvemba and I are going to remain and we're going to otherwise change and bring in some other additional experts and keep up the conversation going. So please join me now in thanking panel one. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.